And now, Britain's Cathedrals and Their Music, a programme in the extended weekly series in which we're exploring some of the music of the English Cathedral Service. Today we visit Gloucester and hear a cathedral choir. The organist and master of the choristers is Herbert Sumption, and he's assisted by Richard Latham, who conducts the three accompanied choral pieces. Once again, the scene is set by John Betjeman. Gloucester Cathedral is one of the most daring buildings in the country. From far off or near to, in sunlight or grey haze, moonlight or glow from streets, its lace-like tower of golden stone and the pinnacles and parapets below look good from whatever angle you see them. The approaches to Gloucester seem to have been built to show the cathedral to advantage. You always see two sides of the tower and the best view of all is that from the west, crossing the River Severn. Stone archways and narrow lanes lead you into the college, which is the name they give at Gloucester to the close. This is because when Henry VIII dissolved the Benedictine monastery, which had been there since Saxon times and was rebuilt by the Normans, he founded a college with a dean and canons to take the place of the monastery. There are houses from medieval to Georgian, in stone, half timber and brick, cluster round the cross-shaped cathedral, a cross with short arms, and the central tower. There's a long tradition in Gloucester of cordial relations between city and cathedral, and we'll go in by the square stone-vaulted 15th century south porch, a comparatively low door with the old ironwork on it, and then See what a contrast the nave presents. Its round Norman pillars are tall and thick, upended cylinders of stone, and the low stone vaulted roof above them, which replaces a wooden Norman ceiling, seems a squashed afterthought. And there, across the east end of the nave, is a stone screen, and perched on it, the grand Renaissance organ case, whose painted pipes you'll hear tonight. It was built at the restoration of Charles II, when the cathedral was brought back to Anglican dignity after the interruption of the Commonwealth. Notice how this screen and organ give just the right hint of more to see beyond. An unbelievably high roof over the choir, with a multiplicity of stone ribs. The walk down Gloucester Cathedral is a procession from glory to glory. First. There's this broad, sturdy and plain Norman nave, built about 1100. Now come into the south transept and see the extraordinary thing that happened. You know, if a monastery wanted money in the late Middle Ages, the thing to do was to have a shrine for pilgrims to visit. And in 1327, Edward II was horribly murdered in Barclay Castle, and a shrewd abbot of Gloucester brought his body to be buried on the north side of the choir. It lies under a beautiful alabaster effigy of the monarch and a pinnacled canopy. A cult of Edward II grew up, and with the money, the monks transformed the east end of their abbey, starting here in this south transept. And what a transformation it was. A new style of building had been started in old St. Paul's and the Palace of Westminster and Bristol Cathedral. Here, in the south transept of Gloucester, you see the earliest surviving example of it, 1330, English perpendicular. It's really scaffolding in stone. There's no figure carving except on the bosses far up in the roof, just thin moulded lines of stone built to receive great areas of stained glass where there are outside walls and which act as wall decoration when there isn't glass. By the 14th century, glaziers were able to fill larger areas with coloured glass than ever before. The east window of Gloucester Choir is over 70 feet high and bigger in area even than the east window of York Minster, and therefore the biggest in Europe of the Middle Ages. I said York was. York has more medieval stained glass in it but Gloucester has a bigger area. 
and this window was built in honour of local knights and barons who fought in the Battle of Cressy. It's a hymn in praise of Our Lady, who was much loved by the pious English. The medieval figures in it show her, our Lord, saints, martyrs, kings and seraphim in sparkling blues and reds on a silvery white ground. The roof of this tent of stone and glass, the choir of Gloucester, has flying angels in gilded stone above the sanctuary. And now come into another glory, the Lady Chapel, which you enter under the east window and which opens out into a second tent of stone and glass. Here, most of the windows were glazed in an attractive arts and crafts style just before the First World War, and there by Christopher Wall in silver and brilliant blues and greens, all well related to the soaring tracery. We'll leave the great moment till the last. Now, we'll come into the cathedral by the way the dean comes through the cloisters. These were built in the late 14th century, and they're the most perfect in England, all four sides of them. They're the scaffolding style turned into decoration. Fountains of stone spray out from the walls and meet in fans over the roof. We'll follow the dean out of the cloister into the Norman nave, the nave which is the age of building solidly, through the screen and in to the age of building lightly, engineering in stone. Look at the skillful use of concealed electric light. The east window has faded into the Gloucestershire night. Beyond, we know, the Lady Chapel waits in gloom. Two candles on the high altar in the choir here just show up Gilbert Scott's delicate Victorian Veridos. The stalls where we're sitting are 14th century woodwork. Between us and the high altar, the effigy of William the Conqueror's son seems to stir on its table as though it wanted to get up and join us. Low lamps show up white surplices, red cassocks, and the faces of men and boys. We can just discern the ribbed roof, which is so high above us, it might almost be the night sky, with gilded bosses for stars. And now you shall hear what a marvellous building is this choir of Gloucester for sound. The music begins with three English anthems well known in church music. The first two are if Ye Love Me by Talis and Justorum Anime by Bird.
The third of these anthems is a great favourite of many cathedrals. It's Lord, Let Me Know Mine End, by the early 18th century composer and organist, Dr. Maurice Green. He became professor of music at Cambridge, and then in 1735, master of the king's music.
From the choir, we can admire the east side of the organ case, or from the finer view. As well as the main case, there is a case of the chair organ, which is even older. It must be one of the oldest in the country. The two cases form a design more restrained than that of the organ at Exeter, but full of interesting detail. The instrument itself was a Willis when Wesley was organist here a hundred years ago, and since 1920 it's been a Harrison. Eight of its stops, however, are as old as the case of 1665. And we now hear Herbert Sumption play the fugue from Bach's Prelude and Fugue in B minor. <laughs>
Parry, who died in 1918, and Howells, who is a Gloucestershire man, have been prominent in English choral music. Many of their works have been performed at the Three Choirs Festival of Gloucester, Worcester and Hereford. Their music can also be heard at services in this cathedral. And we now hear Never Weather Beaten Sail from Perry's Songs of Farewell, one of his last works, and O oh, Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem by Howells.
we end with a work by Gloucester's director of music, Dr. Herbert Sunshine. It is a setting of the Benedicite. <laughs> 